morning and welcome to our 27th session of our webinar series and we are absolutely delighted and privileged to have amongst us today professor wang gangwu from national university of singapore and he was also chairman of our asian scholarship foundation and we are so grateful to professor wang for joining us today because we are also celebrating 15 years of our existence as the association of asia scholars when we formally got registered in 2005 uh, first week of november and uh, he is the one he was the pillar of our asian scholarship foundation through which the asia fellows through 10 cohorts were selected from different asian countries to go and live in another asian country for 9 months so we have really no words to thank and appreciate professor wang gangwu because he is the one who really provided us with this opportunity and helped us to connect with the asia fellows all across the world along with other board members and of course uh, the asf uh, team which also includes professor dr sasithara who is uh, joined us today from manila so we are really delighted that uh, dr sasithara could also join us and pratyush uh, professor pratyush is joining us from nepal so welcome and uh, i'm sure there will be several other asia fellows who will be joining us uh, as we proceed with the lecture so with these words i welcome professor wang gangwu and sincerely thank him and really uh, express our sincere gratitude that you have been able to spare time to give us this lecture today really looking forward to you because the first lecture we organized uh, was a year after we got established that was in 2006 in jawaharlal nehru university sis and after 2006 you know now we are again we have the opportunity to listen to you uh, in this virtual space so thank you very much uh, professor wong and professor swaran singh will now take over Thank you, Milna. Let me first acknowledge uh, Dr. Parvez uh, Maheshar is with us from Pakistan. Uh, he is uh, Asia Fellow who has joined us on uh, the platform of Zoom today. Also acknowledge the uh, presence of uh, Dr. Syed Rahman, another scholar from Pakistan currently in Taiwan. Uh, Dr. Khin Mong So from Myanmar, and of course our Uh, Sasi Thara, uh, we know her for a long time because of her uh, troubling these people with our documents as we were getting Asia fellowships, <laughs> and uh, she has progressed enormously since then. And it's nice to have her also with us. We now have about thirty-two people with us. Uh, Asia fellows, of course, all are uh, in some some sense. Uh, mentees and uh, supervisees and students of professor wang so we all uh, need no introduction to professor wang uh, but we also have today uh, people from other streams joining us and will be joining us so let me briefly uh, introduce uh, professor wang to uh, some of us who may not have uh, really followed his uh, lifetime work in detail olivia ho Uh, does a column for the straight times uh, once a month and talks about uh, what are the best books uh, that one should be reading and she looks at uh, all kinds of disciplines from fisheries to agriculture to fiction to all kinds of sociology uh, this weekend uh, she recommends five books and the first book on top of that column is uh, a book uh, by professor wang kung uh, interesting it is that it is an uh, autobiographical work uh, which is published uh, just very recently called uh, where home is where we are uh, 
and he would remember and as the story goes uh, it has a very interesting link to uh, professor wang and uh, uh, dr margaret wang uh, shifting to anu in 1969 which is where that conversation takes place and the title of uh, this book comes from there and the uh, earlier volume of it was published in 2018 which was interestingly titled home is not here uh, so uh, enormous uh, spectrum of a lifetime to read and i think all of us will be greatly inspired and a uh, lot of new uh, elements i think new chips will open in our uh, you know sort of uh, brain in our uh, way of thinking if we read that autobiographical work of his. Of course, he's done an enormous amount of historical work on Nanyang, on China in general, on uh, particularly overseas Chinese. Uh, uh, I think whole spectrum, even within history that he has uh, looked at over a period of time. And a uh, whole lot of institutions that he has uh, built and served and let me actually say most of us are still at a stage where we think our achievements are that we are mentoring some young scholars and then there are people who are mentoring institutions and i think even beyond are people who are mentoring disciplines and i would believe that professor wang's lifetime contribution has disciplined has mentored a whole discipline of chinese history uh, has given us a very different uh, way of looking at history in general and Chinese history. Uh, and uh, he recalls it himself how in, in 1957, sir, I believe you finished your PhD at SOAS. Uh, and the realization that you have shared with uh, in your writings and speaking of feeling how Asian studies were, you know, more or less done only by European scholars and the commitment you had in ensuring that Asian scholarship is also built among Asian scholars in Asia. And that was uh, your vision behind creating this whole set of uh, Asia fellowships of which nearly 300 Asian scholars, uh, and I am one of them, Professor Rina Barba is one of them, uh, became beneficiaries of that vision uh, of trying to locate Asian studies within Asia. Uh, and we have benefited a great deal uh, because of that, not just in terms of getting an opportunity to spend time in another country, but getting a whole orientation, I think, which was much deeper and has influenced all of us. Uh, our banner mentioned uh, that, uh, that he is uh, chairman of the managing board of Lee Kuan Yew Institute School of Public Policy. Professor Wang just corrected me that he is uh, no longer the chair, but uh, let me mention he's the founding chairman of uh, this Lee Kuan Yew in, in School of uh, Public Policy. And of course, he was also chairman of uh, the East Asia Institute at uh, uh, National University of Singapore. But I mentioned this in my uh, last, uh, you know, sort of webinar. My first encounter with Professor uh, Kang Wu, uh, Wang Kung Wu goes uh, much earlier. Uh, as a young man, I had visited Hong Kong University and I saw a placard, a, a kind of a, a road sign showing the way to Wang Kung Wu Graduate Lecture Hall. Lecture Hall, for, uh, it's a graduate house it is called, Lecture Hall. And uh, I just kind of remembered that there was some name of a former vice chancellor whose name is uh, there on a hall and a direction that the board shows that you can go in that direction until i applied for asia fellows <laughs> much later and came to know that he was the same man uh, as chair of uh, asia foundation uh, and of course since then i have uh, benefited uh, several times listening to him uh, so someone as i uh, want to underline uh, has influenced and touched several lives over a period of uh, almost uh, more than 60 years of uh, active teaching, uh, university level teaching, and uh, built several institutions uh, and inspired, I think, several people and uh, extremely modest. Uh, I think I dare say that's a bit of a Chinese uh, trait, if I am right, sir, uh, that this modesty is uh, completely that uh, 
overalls everybody yeah, when when you know sort of you meet the man and uh, you know his lifetime contribution uh, and the fact that he agreed to speak to our platform on a very interesting topic of rewriting history which i think is repeatedly the greatest challenge for a historian um, especially when uh, you look at still in the binaries of east and west and try to sort of make a value addition or create some kind of original contribution to how history or historiography can be done differently uh, if you are grounded in asian civilizational traditions uh, and i think that's a path breaking kind of an effort which has been an ongoing work of professor wang kung wu and therefore we are extremely delighted that uh, he has agreed to speak to us uh, i have my pen and notebook next to me to take my notes i'm sure several of us will also be carefully you know, listening to him and then of course uh, once his initial exposition uh, is over we will have uh, opportunity to engage him at one to one level so each question we will uh, expect that we will get answer and response from professor wang so that all of us have a great take away from today's discussion uh, and this interaction between us uh, with that with warm uh, regards and uh, deep appreciation to his having come to speak to us today uh, i will now request professor wang to start his initial exposition uh, professor wang thank you swaran you began by referring to the two new books that i've done which is about my early life and this reminds me in a ways related to the talk that i'm going to give today uh because i grew up in a protected malay state as it were before it became malaya and later on malaysia and uh, i knew no history i didn't do any history uh, li a little bit of history from the classical studies that my father taught me in chinese about china's classical studies because he was going to bring me home to china uh, so malay was not going to be my home so china was to be my home and what he wanted me to have is the chinese language and to be able to fit into china one day when i have the chance to get there as the book ends i did not get to china i go into china and had to come out again because of circumstances and i finally made my home in malaya and i spent the next 20 years and this is in my second volume through the, my study at the university of malaya to try and become a, a citizen of this new country called malaya which didn't exist so what history did i learn i did take history at the this colonial university the university of malaya and the history in other words i was introduced to history through an imperial view of the world uh, a british one in terms of empire and commonwealth it didn't interest me very much didn't didn't seem to concern me but nevertheless that was the way i was introduced to history and underlying it all was the idea that we in malaya didn't have any history in one sense that's correct there was no such country called malaya there were various malay states and none of them really had any serious work on its own history there was a sajarat malay you the malay annals which of course the british historians who wrote about this british malay that they had created they immediately said that's not history that's just anecdotes stories stories by rulers and kings and aristocrats uh, that's not history that is not written as history it's written with all kinds of stories so the determination right from the beginning was that we had no history the british introduced us to history they wrote our history so anyway that's how i got introduced into it uh, and i decided to be curious about i was curious about it they decided that i shall uh, try and master this idea of the fact that we have no history and maybe it's our job as citizens of this new country to write the history of malaya and some of us it, it crossed our minds to do that i was of course a little bit torn because i was also curious about the history of china uh, and particularly curious about china because i had been to china at a turning point 
when the Kuomintang lost to the communists and a, a major shift in China from a nationalist, more or less committed to a liberal capitalist system that they, they had learned from the West and then turn around to a Soviet communist vision, a Marxist vision, Marxist-Leninist vision of history in the past, describing history in a quite a different way. So the Chinese themselves were undergoing a, a real challenge to their thinking about their own past. So although I didn't use the word at the time and didn't hear it much, they were actually forced to rewrite their history because of the changing circumstances of China as they moved from a dynastic Qing China to the Republic of China and then to the People's Republic of China. Each time they were rewriting, uh, they, were, they had to contemplate how to rewrite their history. I'll come back to that later. Let me go back again. Having sort of left China and deciding to live in Malaya, so I started by looking at what it meant to have a Malayan history. And of course, while doing that, I was observing the fact that all our neighbors in Southeast Asia, and most of all, India, which is near to, nearby, was going undergoing a, an experience which was extremely fascinating to me. Because my first visit to India was in 1951 as a young student, taking part in some student activities. But this is when I first met and had the chance to sit among hundreds of students listening to the Prime Minister of India, uh, Mr. Nehru, talking to us about the history of India. In a way, of course, he did, introducing us to his great book, The Discovery of India. So the word was introduced to me as a discovery of India, and which is basically about Indian history. So, so in a way, he was rewriting the Indian, the history of India as he understood it by his own self-discovery of the history of India. So I was taken very much attracted to this idea of discovering something. So I, like many other young people at the time, inspired to look back and see what it was. A very good example, my, my fellow student member, student leader at the time attended this gathering was Romila Tapa. And Romila Tapa, as those historians of India who recognize one of the great historians of India, was in that same audience with me. And she was not only rediscovering, she was rewriting Indian history in a way, not, not by herself, but the whole generation of young Indians who were going back to look at the whole of Indian history from be, be, in, in a way responding to the fact if other people had histories written for three, 4,000 years, what did India offer? What, what was India to offer? And it has not been written in the same way, but the fact that they had history was not in dispute. It's a question of how you write it. So you either write it or you rewrite it. These words are, you know, at the time was not very much discussed, but nevertheless that was happening. So I remember Romila was there, I was there, and I, what she was thinking about for India, I began also thinking about China. What was China doing? They, they were also rewriting the history, except as I said, I didn't use to say that word, but what attracted me was Nehru's word, discovery of India. So I had to, in a way, to discover China, China's, China's history in my own way. So because I was not interested in the British Empire, and wasn't terribly uh, excited to, to do anything about it, I thought maybe I should turn my attention to discovering Chinese history. So I turned to Chinese history. And I did, and I learned a tremendous amount. I won't go into that, but it's just to show you my background. I was trained to look at the past by European historians. And it was European history that gave me the idea of what we now call professionally historiography, the study of history, how to write history, what are the ingredients that make good history and what makes bad history, and how you can use history for all sorts of purposes, as propaganda, as all kinds of uh, uh, instruments and tools used by various people for different reasons. So history is a very amorphous thing that can be used by others. So the professionals had to come in and say, let us make clear there is history as done by professionals, objectively, skillfully, mastering all the documentation, making sure that everything is verified, the evidence is 
indisputable, and then you write, and that is objective history, and that is the professionalization of it. And of course, I only then discovered that this professional historian was really a very modern creature. There was no such thing as a professional history historian until the 19th century in Europe. It was in Europe, maybe some people come, people go back to Voltaire and Rousseau in the 18th century, but the professional historian in a university teaching the history of his own country, of his neighbors, of his own civilization, and of the world history, that only began in the 19th century, when the first universities seriously appointed historians not to glorify their own history, but to write scientific, accurate, objective history. At least that was the goal. So it was only in the 19th century that this profession of history really took off, and it took off in Europe. There was no such profession, as far as I know, anywhere else uh, as a profession. People wrote history as an official or as an in, in individual interested or as a storyteller, and it com comes out in the form of drama, in theater, in, in, uh, in, in, in novels, or so many different ways you can tell about the past without actually drawing upon as it was the so-called professional skills that would make objective history a, a new kind of history. So it was in that context that I realized that what the Europeans were doing, these professionals were doing, well, they were rewriting history. They didn't, I think they didn't call it that. They were, in their minds, they were writing history because there was no such thing. Never been properly done. They, for the first time, were properly writing history. Now, that's fine. They were doing it. And they were doing it for their own countries because as a new, another new thing was developing in Europe, which is not found anywhere else in the world, was the emergence of nations. The idea of a nation, of course, people trace it back to the Treaty of Westphalia, and then they trace it back to the uh, further forward to uh, say the French Revolution, the American Revolution, when the Americans would claim that they were the first nation in a way arguable, but some people would argue that the Dutch were the first nation when they broke away from the Spanish Empire to, to establish a country called the Netherlands. Yet others would say it was the French Revolution that created a, a, the idea of a nation, but in, in fact, that's a very confusing idea because Napoleon almost immediately started to build a French empire. So uh, he wasn't satisfied with being just a nation. So all, all I can see all these words were being used in that context. And where were these words, where did these words come from? At least the word empire, we are quite, cl quite clear, and the Europeans made it quite clear. That came from the word imperium in, in Latin. If the Roman empire was the model of the empire, that word was not used by anybody else. I mean, I can't find in any other language a word which is exactly like the word empire. The word empire is imperium. It is the Roman empire. Even, it, even they use it back, trace it back to what the Alexander's empire, to Egyptian, and they use the word empire retrospectively to describe earlier things, Persian empire, Hellenistic empire, and so on. But actually the word that we now have adopted everywhere else is is from Imperium, and that is the model. And what they did was, uh, they, in the 19th, in the 20th, 18th and 19th century, what they did was to re-sort re re that out. Now, we now have something which more, than, not that just an empire. In Europe, what is happening is the Roman Empire is gone. There's a Holy Roman Empire, which is something abstract and, and nobody knew exactly what it meant. It meant different things to different people. But it once claimed to the, to the Catholic Church to, uh, and, the, and the power of the Pope and his relations with all the rulers of, of Europe in medieval Europe established a kind of relationship which kept the idea of a holy Roman Empire and kept the word empire somewhere there. But what they did after that was that they found themselves fighting over religion, wars of religion, 100 years war, 30 years war, all kinds of wars that drew all these kind, little, little kingdoms and prince, prince, princedoms fighting each other until some, somebody wisely said, let's stop fighting. You know, why are we killing each other? Why, why don't we find some way of living in peace? Because there are enemies out there or there are opportunities elsewhere which we should spend our energies on instead of just killing each other. So they sat down and the Treaty of Westphalia defined the idea of a sovereign state, that this sovereign state would have absolute right in their country. Nobody is supposed to intervene with them. They all 
each of them respect the boundaries of each other's state. And from that emerged the idea of nation. And that really came about, I would say, I, I personally like to believe that it came from the Netherlands because they, when they broke from the Spanish empire, basically they created a nation state called Netherlands. But, now, but they didn't have much influence. The great influence came from the French. The French idea of the French nation, the citoyen, the, the citizens of France. It was a nation of all citizens. Everybody was part of this nation. And that idea took off. And the Americans had it because the American Revolution drew upon French ideals. And then they, they built their own nation. And it was, I think, it can be a claim for being the first nation. And much easier for them because they're far away, left alone, and they were peacefully doing their own thing to create their own nation without being disturbed. As in Europe, it was not possible. Many of those German states, for example, impossible to be a, a nation. And it took them an, another hundred years before the Germans became a nation and the Italians under Gattivaldi and all that became an Italian nation and, he, and a German nation. But you know how long that took? And it was a terrible thing. Many people had to die before they could decide what was a, a German nation. And even then they couldn't decide. They started looking at, for Germans in Czechoslovakia, looking for German, uh, Bohemia, and looking for Germans in Austria, Austro-Hungarian Empire, using the German language. Mm -hmm. And it took a long time to define what is a German. And even to this day, I mean, they are German speakers is spread in different countries. So you can see that how difficult it was. But what was significant was few, a few of those nations became successful empires. Now, this is very confusing. You started with an empire, and then you say the empires had a lot of colonies, territories, and so on. And now you suddenly have a nation and the nation takes over the empire. The, the British Empire and the French and the Dutch and these three empires are very clear examples of having the nation identified with the empire. It was a na each, each one of them was a national empire. That is really what they introduced. That was beyond what the Romans had. The Romans did not have a concept of nation. They had the Roman Empire and the Roman Empire collapsed. It broke it up in all sorts of feudal little states and took a long time just to sort it out. This is a thousand odd years to sort that out. But now, these powerful, started with East India companies and so on, created empires, but taken over by the na new national states of Netherlands, France, and Britain, in that order for, to begin with. But that's a new, completely new idea, a national empire. And the result of it all was the successful imperialism that spread into Asia, Africa, but partly it started in a way, Spanish empire in Latin America, but the Spanish didn't have quite that same dedication to the concept of empire and nation the way the other three did because the Spanish did not develop quite the same powerful dedication to nation building the way the, the Dutch, French, and the, the British ultimately did and did not have that kind of East India Company background, the secular background which separated from the kind of church background which the Spanish emphasized. But whatever it was, by the 19th century, we had the national empire. They spread all over. Well, in Asia, of course, India was in the front line of all this. You were, were the first target of all, all this uh, imperial expansion. And uh, I don't need to go into that. The history of it is you are more familiar than I am. But Southeast Asia, the same thing. And then eventually to China. Each step of the way, introducing the idea of empire to describe themselves, but a national, a British empire, a French empire, a Dutch empire. And so, so quite clearly a national empire. Now this is new. But one of the consequences of that was that after another hundred years of fighting among themselves, killing each other for, for reasons which are now almost impossible to understand, and creating in Asia one country that responded to that very quickly to want to have their own empire, and that was Japan. Japan developed at the same time the idea of a nation, and they discovered Japan was a nation. It can be much more like a nation, more homogenous than almost any other country in Asia. The nearest thing to a nation in Asia that you could find was probably Japan. 
into Japan, discovered Japan as a nation. And the next thing was, if we are a nation and those nations out there can have empires, we too can have empires. So it was the first country in Asia to say that as a nation, we can have our own empire. And they started the real pills, Korea, and then ultimately trying Manchuria, and then finally going for China, and the most ambitious of all. Something that even the French, the British, all the other empires dared not try to do because they were able to do it in India and elsewhere for all sorts of different reasons. But in the case of China, they all hesitated. They all stopped each other from taking over China. What they were prepared to do was to share China among themselves, breaking up little bits of their own spheres of influence, but they weren't prepared to take on the whole of China. The, the Qing Empire was sufficiently, just, just enough to hold them back. In any case, in their own interest, they didn't want to do it. So China was, in a way, protected by the rivalries of these empires, not to be taken over as a whole, not the way ultimately India was. China somehow was saved from that by circumstances that are not entirely in, under their control. The only country that really thought they could take over China was Japan. And again, their model was the national empire, a Japanese empire. Of course, they did so in the name, and it's very interesting, there's an Asian response to it. They took over that idea of a national empire, but justified it on the grounds that they are there to help the Asians drive the Europeans out. And this is the slogan they use. So Asia for the Asians idea, which of course appealed to many others in Asia, all over India, Southeast Asia, there were people who thought the Japanese were onto something which was meaningful to them too. If they could only get together, they could drive the Europeans out and then give ourselves a chance to rebuild our own, own states and so on. So it is in that background that each one discovered their history. I, I, I wouldn't want to oversimplify, but in a way, Nehru's discovery of India was the first of its kind, articulated beautifully long before any other leader could do it. But ultimately, they all did in, its, in their own way. I mean, Rizal in the Philippines, Sun Yat-sen from China, and others from Indonesia, ultimately later a bit, Sukarno and others. <coughs> Aung San did it for them. All of them tried in their own way to build a new nation out of this idea, but still very unclear what to do because they were all under uh, um, imperial control and the colonial rule was still very strong. But if you come to come back to Japan, Japan's historic role was extremely significant. They were the ones, because they believed in a national empire of Japan and that Japan could get all the Asians together led by Japan to throw all the Europeans out, then there'll be a whole bunch of Asian territories owing something to Japan who have driven, helped to driven, driven, helped to drive the Europeans, out, the imperialists out of, out of Asia. Of course, they didn't succeed. But what they did succeed was it actually put an end to, at least helped, in addition to the Second World War, the Pacific War helped to end the era of imperialism of the kind that was created in the 18th and 19th century. That came to an end. So what we, my generation found ourselves in 1945 was a decolonization. That when I went in 1951 to Delhi and listened to Prime Minister Nehru, we were the generation who saw the beginnings of this new era of independent nation states in Asia. But none of us, with the exception of Japan, really knew what a nation was like. I mean, you take the various examples. As each empire left, and, and this, is, this is important, that idea of the Roman Empire had one particular feature about it, which is interesting. When the Roman Empire collapsed, all the Romans, or if, if there were any left, left to go back to Rome or left to go somewhere else. There was no remnants behind. They had, they had gone off. The idea of the empire remained in the Catholic Church and so on, but the Romans basically went home. This idea survived in this decolonization period in 1945. 
basically all those national empires went home back to their own nations. The British back to Britain, the French went back to France, Dutch went back to Netherlands, even the Americans left the Philippines and went back to America, at least in theory, but they, they didn't end entirely. But that's a different, slightly different story. And the Japanese certainly went back. They came out of Manchuria, Korea, Taiwan, Ryukyu, uh, except Ryukyu, they all went back to Japan. So that was a pattern. The new pattern was empires would end when all the national leaders who had created the empires would all pull, the, pull back, bring their home, their troops back, their officials back to their own country. So that became the pattern. Of course, when they pulled back, what did they leave behind? The idea was they leave, we would leave behind the basis or the foundations of a new nation. And this is the empire they left behind. Now, most of them did it willingly or not. They did something like that. But you can see the differences. For example, perhaps the most striking example is British India. Now, British India, they were very reluctant. They didn't really want to leave, but they had no choice. They couldn't, just couldn't keep up, could, couldn't come, keep, stay on. But what they didn't want to leave behind was that India exactly as they had it, British India. So they, in fact, allowed partition to take place. And the Indians couldn't stop them. Right? And that's a different story. But what happened was they left, but they did leave behind British India as India. The Dutch left. They didn't also voluntarily leave. They were forced to leave. They didn't want to leave Indonesia as one Indonesia either. They wanted different federal states and wanted to break it up to, to not to be exactly as Indonesia as a, as a new nation. And as you know, they tried very hard to stop uh, West Aryan from being part of. So they, they want to redraw the map and leave out West Aryan and leave the rest. In, in, even then, they were very reluctant, but they were forced to do it. All this happened. The French, of course, as you know, very reluctant but they were forced to leave, at least in the case of Vietnam, they had to bring in the Americans to try, and, uh, to try and sort things out for them. But it was a mess. And finally, they went, they went home. The Americans came in, didn't make any sense out of it, and they had to go home. So Vietnam came, became one state. But even then, I won't go into the details, but they, they had to think of themselves as one state. Now, both in the case of India and Indonesia, you can say the new generation of historians could write the history of India, write the history of Indonesia. I would say Malaysia even more so. What was Malaysia? Uh, Malaysia was really bitty. It wasn't even under one administration for, for any, any amount of time, virtually not at all. They were all different Malay states, two, three colonies of straight settlements under Penang, Malacca, and Singapore, which left Singapore alone. And then there was Sabah and Sarawak, all bits and pieces. What kind of a nation was that? And the British knew that, it wasn't, but all right, they, they were gonna leave anyway. So they helped the people around in the area to draw this new map from Malaysia. It was a new map, brand new map. It was drawn in 1963, and three, two years later, Singapore was kicked out. So it was, it was again redrawn in 1965, and it's still there, but lots of internal difficulties. Indonesia, same thing. There were attempts to secede. Aceh tried very hard. To, today, to this day, West Syrian, there are still people there who, out, who want to be separate. And later on, they tried to take in East Timor and they failed. You can see how there was no fixed map. Yeah, all the maps were all boundaries, were all very, uh, shall we say, uh, uh, intangibly. <laughs> caught up in all kinds of little little quarrels and so on. And even today, I mean, I was amused to see the other day that the Philippines want to claim back Sabah again. So, I mean, even when there are friendly nations between Malaysia and Indonesia, that's raised up its ugly head again. So you can see that all these boundaries, what is nation, all really unclear. So what we're observing, of course, is everybody is writing their own national history. And I was involved in that by being head of a history department at the University of Malaya until I left because I, I decided I wanted to work on China. I, I decided that that's not the work I was, I was keen to do. But nevertheless, you can see we made a start to try and write history. 
But people will say, you are actually rewriting history. And that is the word, and I will come back to this later. There's a difference between writing and rewriting is of some, some significance. But to us, we were writing national history. But in another sense, we were rewriting it because there were, it was, there was a history, little bits of history here and there. We are trying to pull it together and make sense of, and make a new sense, make it, draw a new map, new parameters, and, and suggest that this is a new history. In a way, rewriting the history of all those little states to make it a history of one country. And even then, not easy. Singapore left out this, all kinds of things didn't, didn't fit. Anyway, that was how we tried to do. Some countries are very much more difficult. And you, you, you all in India would know what it meant to write history of India and then what to do with Pakistan, Bangladesh. Uh, these are, you know, of the British India. And if you want to go further back, where was India? Where were the borders of India? These are all issues of, uh, require a lot of work. work. And in many ways, Nehru's discovery of India, you could also say he was rewriting the history of India. There was a history of India in the minds of various people, but a different meaning of the word history, but a, re a recollection, a deep memory of sharing things together over millennia and so on. But to disc by discovering India, he, he in a way had reframed the history of India in his own mind. And then the professional historians later on got into the act to try and redo this. And where do you fit the Muslims? Where do you fit the Mughals? Where do you fit the others? All that, and how do you work out even the difference between the, the Dravidians and the Aryans further north? All that had to be worked out. And this is writing history, or you can say it's rewriting history. In fact, one of the most fascinating things, when, things when I remember as a young student, absolutely fascinated, how do you fit in the Indus Valley civilization? Even that, that took a long time, to a lot of archaeologists and scholars, to fit it into the history of India. And even then now it's no longer part, quite part of the history of India. People say it's part of the history of Pakistan. So you can see how it difficult it is for historians to, to think of history beyond a certain point. To come back now, I want to concentrate a little bit more on China, a little bit more, just to give an example of why this word rewriting is quite important today. And that is that in the case of China, unlike the other parts of Asia where earlier empires like the uh, Majapahit Empire or Malacca Empire or the uh, Maurya Empire or you know, there is earlier Mo or the Mughal Empire for that matter, uh, unlike all of them, they were more or less pushed aside by the national empires of the 18th and 19th century and then reshaped already, done by the, the West did it already. So the, in a way, if you want to do it again, you are rewriting it, that's in, the, in that sense. In the case of China, and this is the peculiar part of China, they describe the Qing as an empire. The, the, the Europeans call China, and they say China consists of the Qing Empire. That was more or less equivalent. It, it started with the Ming Empire, the Jesuits called the Ming Empire was the Qing. The Ming Dynasty, Ming was, a, was the Chinese Empire. It became the Qing Empire. Qing, China was the Qing Empire. So they used the word empire because that was the word they would know. Because it's more than one territory, it takes on different, the different places, like the Manchus, Mongols, the Tibetans, and the, uh, uh, the Turkish, Turkistan, Turkistan people. Uh, and uh, therefore, it was an empire. The Chinese actually didn't have a word for empire. Their words were Tianxia, Huaxia, all the other words are either description of civilizations, cultures, or various kinds of peoples who share some language, uh, written language, or share certain cultural values. Uh, but there was no concept of nation to begin with, and no concept of empire. These were words entirely drawn from the West. But when the Qing Empire fell, in 1912 and was succeeded by the Republic of China, the Chinese knew they had to do something about it because now they were inheriting a, a, a place called Qing China becoming the Republic of China. How do you do that? Now it is very interesting and this is very important now. When Sun Yat-sen claimed 
to establish the Republic of China in Nanjing in 1912, January. Nobody recognized it. The French, the British, the, all, the, all the key countries refused to acknowledge it. All their embassies were in Beijing and they acknowledged the Qing dynasty. That was the Qing empire. That was legitimate. Who, who, who are you, this Republic of China in Nanjing? No country recognized it, not one. So Sun Yat-sen was desperate. He had it for several months. Provisional president of the Republic of China recognized by nobody. So he finally, he, he got the point. They would never recognize him because all the embassies were there and the legitimacy was with the Qing dynasty. So what he did, he gave up his presidency, offered it to Yuan Shikai, who was the most powerful military figure in the Qing court at the time. Although he was a Han Chinese and not a Manchu, he was trusted by the Manchus and was the most powerful military man. So Natsen offered it to him. He said, we offer you the presidency of the Republic of China. We will recognize you as that. If you establish that legitimately, we would accept you as president. And Yuan Shikai was tempted. So he went along to the Manchu emperor, with the empress Darja, because the emperor was a little boy of, of six years old. And the empress Darja faced with the fact that the Manchus are defeated, they're gone. They have lost their mandate of heaven, so to speak. And with most, almost all the Chinese dynasties, when the dynasty comes to an end, everybody gets slaughtered. That's what happened to the previous Chinese dynasties. So the, if they hung on to at the end in a hopeless condition, one day all those Manchu aristocrats and uh, members of the imperial family would, would face the, that end, that horrible end of being slaughtered. Like in, in effect, almost the same happened to the Tsarists at the end of Tsarist Russia. But anyway, Yuan Shikai said, if you abdicate, and gave your legitimacy to me as the president of the Republic of China, I will guarantee that all your lives will be saved. That was the deal. And the Manchu court in the end, after a long deliberation, accepted that agreement. And they officially handed over the Manchu empire, which they never called themselves that, but the empire was handed over to Yuan Shikai as the president of the Republic of China. And what, he, what they handed over, of course, theoretically, was the whole territory of the Qing Empire. And, and to, to the West, interestingly, all those embassies in Beijing, the British, the French, and the, all the others, they recognized the Qing Empire, and the map of the Qing Empire was the legitimate territory of the Qing Empire. And whatever sovereignty meant in those days, Qing Empire sovereignty over its the, the map that the, it was internationally recognized was what was handed over by the Qing Emperor to Yuan Shikai. Of course, there were a lot of people who had doubts. The Japanese, for example, never accepted that. And, uh, and the Mongols almost immediately said, no, we are not part of China. We cannot be part of the Republic of China. We were part of the Qing court. The Qing dynasty are our sort of cousins. We fought together. We created the Qing dynasty. We are brothers. And, we, and if the Qing dynasty fall, we pull out. Nothing to do with the uh, Republic of China. And the Mongols said that. The Tibetans were different kind of relationship, didn't even bother to say it, but they assumed they were different. But whatever it was, the international situation at the time made it possible for the Qing state to pass on that legitimacy to the Republic of China without anybody objecting to the, uh, without the great empires anyway, objecting to the heritage of that map and the territorial extent of the Qing Empire now being part of the Republic of China. At least that was how it was perceived at the time, both by the Chinese and by the foreign community. There was no other China, Republic of China simply took over the map of Qing China. Now, this is very strange. This is where the Republic of China now comes out to say, we are now the Republican nation. They have adopted the word. That is what Sun Yat-sen talks about nationalism. He was, a he was using a word, 
which he took from the French and the Americans. And the Republic was also, the word Republic was taken from the French and the Americans because they didn't want a monarch. No king, no, they didn't want any rulers. Republic, France and America were the models. And therefore China was now a Chinese nation, a nation state followed as a Republic. And this is how the Chinese began to see it. So what the first thing they had to do was to rewrite their history. Now in the, in the Chinese case, the word rewrite was immediately correct because they had already plenty of history. Unlike many other countries who may have written history in different forms, in the, in the case of the Chinese, they actually called it something like history all along. And they've had it for over 2000 years and more or less continuous somehow in dynastic terms, in their, their cyclical view of history, in, they've kept it going and they accept a kind of continuity for certainly from the Qin Shi Huang, Han Qin Han period down to the present, in fact, way back to Shang and Zhou and to the legendary emperors. They've done all that and they, they made it into their historical framework. But this framework now doesn't apply to the Republic of China. So what do they do? What did uh -huh. they do? They, they tried to rewrite their history. Right. One of the first things they did was extraordinary. Uh, what they did was to say to accept the European idea, there's such an idea as ancient history, medieval history, modern history. And one of the most striking books that emerged from this Republic of China was a book called the Modern History of China. There was no such word as Qingdai, modern. In fact, there's no such thing as Chungfu to apply to a nation state. Chungfu was a vague concept of a central state in the middle of many, many other states. It just happened to be the central one. It's a purely ge geographical term, a conceptually uh, a different kind of uh, a starting point. But now they call Chungfu. Chungfu is identified with China and Qin Daishi with modern history, and it should begin from the Opium War. Now, that is a major break into the Chinese continuity of their own history. Why I say that is definitely rewriting history, because up to the point, all Chinese history has been written in terms of dynasties. And if that was followed, then there's a Ming history, which came to an end, and the Qing dynasty wrote the Ming history. As the Ming, his, his Ming dynasty had written the Yuan history, and Yuan had done the Song history, and so on. That was the convention and was accepted as the way legitimacy passed on from one dynasty to another through its standard history. So one of the first things that China, the, the Chinese traditional thing which we say, now that the Qing dynasty has fallen, it's up to the Republic of China to write Qing history. But the Republic says, well, but we're not dynastic anymore. We are a modern history. We are following the European model of the Republic and our history, our modern history, began in 1840s. Nothing to do with the Qing dynasty, one way or the other. 1840s, because of the opening of, the, of China by the West, and China had to restart a new way of thinking about the world. And that is modern history. So they rewrote their history, modern history starting from 1840s. So what happens to the Qing, Qing dynasty? Because the Qing dynasty wrote the Ming history, the Ming history ended in 1644. And then modern history, as the historians in the 20th century agreed, not only the Kuomintang historians, the national historians, the communist historians agreed with it too. They all agreed modern history will start from 1840s. Then what happens to the period from 1644 to 1840s? Didn't quite fit. It was not. So what they did was they said, all that is ancient history. So it's basically divided the Chinese history into Gu Dai Shi, ancient history. Anything before 1800 or 1840s, anything after 1840s is modern history. Because they don't have a medieval history. The word medieval has got completely different meaning and connotations from European fall of the Roman Empire and the, and the, and the beginning of the Renaissance and so on. Nothing that could match what was happening in China. So they, they didn't use it at all. So that's Gu Dai Shi. Ancient history to 1840, modern history after 1840. It actually makes very little sense. It's very difficult. But anyway, they decided to do that. And, and yet, that was not enough. 
the nationalists did it in those terms of the Chinese nation really beginning from the 1840s, a modern nation. But yet, that didn't satisfy them. They said, hang on, uh, that there was a Chinese nation way back. Yeah, who are these people? Now, during the Qing Dynasty, the Qing Dynasty developed a, more, a phrase to distinguish the Manchus from the Han Chinese. And the Manchus used the word Han to distinguish them from the Manchus. These are Han Chinese. So since the Manchus have used it, now the nationalists use the word Han because they to distinguish themselves from the Manchus. Now they've taken over from the Manchus. Now but they say, this new nation will be the nation of all these nationalities, one of which the component part, the largest part, were the Han. And they use the five, they call the five nations into one China, Chinese nation. The Zhong Hua Minzu invented these words. No question, they invented the words Zhong Hua Minzu with five nations. The Han Chinese, the Manchus, the Mongols, the Turkic peoples, and the Tibetans. These are the five major ones. There are all sorts of other minorities, another 50 or so uh, scattered around, very small. But these are the five major ones. And this was Republic of China, starting with five nations. Wu Zhu Kung He, it was a five nation republic. That's how the country began. And the Kuomintang started with that. The communists didn't quite like the phrase, it didn't fit their Marxist, Leninist, Stalinist uh, definitions. So they modified it about, didn't, didn't emphasize that, but they talked about that they, they kept the term of the Chinese in the context of Han Chinese and the minorities. They used the Stalinist word nationalities. There are 50 odd nationalities within China, which adds to all the confusions. They've added now 50 nationalities uh, uh, in, in addition to the Han nation. Han nationality is one out of 56, 55 others plus the Han. So they invented that. And then since then, they've come be very uncomfortable with all these, all these nationalities. Now, what, what we're reaching now to the point is that the whole language of modern, of historiography today uses the language that was devised by the professional historians in Western Europe to begin with, from which all of us have derived the vocabulary of history. All of us use, whether we use them, in, uh, use some social science terms or, or purely classical terms of European classical terms, but we have adopted that whole rhetoric. We use that for Indian nation. Also, we use it for Chinese nation. We use the word nation empire in, the, in, that, ter, in that framework. Empire meaning the Roman Empire and what happened to the Roman Empire sets up the model of how empires behaved and how empires ended by becoming many nations. That become a general sort of pattern that empires end and following that several nations will come out of the empire. And the classic example to start with was the Austro-Hungarian Empire. In a way, it started with the whole idea of Holy Roman Empire breaking up into the Germans, Italians, and French, and others. The Austro-Hungarian Empire was a clear example. One empire, something like 10 nation states emerged out of that, including those miscellaneous ones, which became Yugoslavia, but also all the others like Hungary, Austria, bits of Czechoslovakia, and so on and so forth. Now that's the classic example. In a way, the Mughals they had already done that. If they did it, forced it, the British had done it there. But these are actual empires which survived till the First World War and then collapsed and broke up. So that became the model. Empires collapsed, followed by many nations. And the second one was the Ottoman Empire. Again, the Ottoman Empire, miscellaneous, covered most, half the Mediterranean, most of West Asia, including bits and pieces of, uh, of, uh, of the Central Asia and then centered on constant Istanbul and so on. So when that break up, the Brit again, the British helped them in the First World War, got all the Arabs out of the Turkish, they call it the Turkish Empire. And so the Turkish Empire, the Turks would go back to Turkey, all the others would be separated, and the British managed to break them up into numerous Arab states, which suited them very well. They're all very small and all dependent on the British and the French. The British and the French together cooperated and sorted out all these different Arab states. So one empire ends with many, many nation states. And Turkey itself 
the Turks go home to Turkey, and Turkey becomes a nation. The Turks never saw themselves as a nurse nation. Suddenly became through uh, uh, the, the Turkish leader uh, and became a, the, the Turkish nation. But now, of course, they're also re-examining re this today. I won't go into that. But you can see that all this causes rewriting of history. Every step of the way, everybody was rewriting history. Now, the interesting thing is that it, does, it doesn't work for China, not quite like that. And they say something is wrong. This Chinese empire, it didn't break up into 10, 5, however many nation states. It should have, because according to the European Eurocentric history, the whole world should be like that. Empire to nation is a kind of absolute universal phenomenon. It must happen. So if China was the Qing Empire was an empire, now that it's called a Chinese nation, then something else must be happening. There must be bits of those, that empire must be broken up into different states. And that, is, that should be the case because then it follows the norm. That follows the rule, the universal principles that would apply to China. And the fact that it's not happening is causing great unhappiness. So you can find now, and now, and now I introduce the word, uh, I've actually mentioned it already before, the word invention. Uh, actually, it comes from uh, a brilliant insight of Benedict Anderson when he talked about Indonesia. When he, did, he, he explained Indonesia, he talked about the imagined community is a nation. In other words, there was no nation. And he, he proved it decisively. There was no such thing as an Indonesian nation. The Indonesians imagined it and it became real ultimately because of the imagination led it to create it. So the word imagined community then slept, crept into the word invention. And that was, you have to thank the Terence Ranger for that, the invention of tradition. To invent, there's no such a tradition at all. Everybody invents his own tradition. So you use the word invent. Now the imagined and the invent are now brought in. And I said the original word, which is Nehru's discovery, which has really come from within, these are words that are applied to you. You are imagining it, you're inventing it. And then they are applied to China. And, and I think I, I can see why. And it, it makes sense because you say, well, you didn't, you didn't have a nation, so you invented it, you're pretending you're a nation. You didn't, you didn't call it Han before, you now call it Han, you invented that. You now call it uh, 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 the Chinese, uh, China, you call China, China, where there was no such thing. China is a Western word. In fact, some people date it from, from Sanskrit, from Qin, and all sorts of other sources. Uh, it's a foreign word. The Chinese never called themselves China until the, until the late 19th or 20th century, when they adopted it from the West. It's true, there's no question the Chinese adopted all this, but the Chinese did it uh, in the simple, in a very simple-minded idea that they're becoming modern. They're becoming modern, they're being progressive, they're becoming like everybody else. They will use all these uh, terms and they accept it like all of us. We've accepted this professional historiographical framework based on the European experience. And in particular, in this particular case, based on the idea of empire to nation, to apply, it must be universal, it must apply to everybody. And so in that context, the Chinese don't fit. And now the Chinese feel, hang on, we have our own history. What is wrong with our history? And that goes back, let me just find, end by end, to trace the Chinese experience. What went wrong? You, you can say what went wrong. What went wrong was, as I said, the first thing was, Chinese modern history began in 1840. You broke off with the Qing dynasty and they didn't know how, what, to make, what sense to make of it. And the, and the historians outside have said, the Qing dynasty, Qing China was not China. Qing dynasty was a Manchu empire. Now this is very interesting. By insisting that it was a Manchu empire, they're comparing it to the, like the British empire in India or the Dutch empire in Indonesia. The Manchu empire was China. And so when the Manchu empire fell, what should have happened and did not happen was the Manchus would go back to their own country and leave behind several nations, all the nations that had been part of the Manchu empire. That should have happened. This is the, the model, which is all the others happened. 
But the Manchus didn't go back to Manchuria. The Manchus became Chinese. They were completely, they lost their language. Most of them completely no longer used Manchu. They all spoke Chinese, they wrote Chinese, they, they became Chinese or indistinguishable. And they, they did not really have a home in Manchuria anymore. What happened was in the 19th century, they had opened up Manchuria to settlement by uh, other peoples and the Han people moved there by the millions. And uh, Manchuria was no longer the homeland of the Manchu. They had no home to return to. So it was an exceptional condition. But as a result, this is a case where the Manchu Empire, the Manchus did not go home and leave behind numerous nations. On the contrary, the Manchu Empire, as the West would call it, suddenly became the Republic of China, and in the eyes of the Chinese, a Han-based multinational state called the People's Republic of China. And the, uh, the first step was modern history began in the 1840s, cut off from the dance history. Already that created difficulty with the Chinese. The very, very divided to rewrite write the Qing history. They must write the Qing history. And as some of you would know, in uh, as late as recently, 20 years ago, a big team was set up in China to write Qing history. Hundreds of scholars. And they've written it, as far as I understand, they've written it, but they haven't published it because there are lots of things in it which don't quite fit and they know how to explain it. So they are in great difficulties. But this goes to example, this goes to show how much they're caught in their own have acceptance of the terminology, the narrative, the discourse set up by European experience of history, applied now to the rest of the world, and when it applied to China, it has caused great difficulties for Chinese. As I said, the, the second stage was even more interesting. First, they went through this, following the European phrase, and have a nationalist China. It failed. The communists took over. And the communists leaned to the Soviet Marxist-Leninist model, which was also Western, but not in the same way. I mean, Karl Marx was actually as Western as you can imagine. But having been sort of modified by Lenin and Stalin, it became sort of slightly uh, Easternized or Orientalized and changed some of its uh, fundamental features and became something quite different. Couched in ideological terms, in terms of progressive stages of slavery, feudalism, uh, capitalism to socialism, all these things were different categories altogether, which the Chinese took. And Mao Zedong in his uh, old age got carried away and went so far as to say that, uh, you know, we, in China we'll be the first to lead the road to, to communism and the Cultural Revolution. How many people died for that cause in the course of that mad idea that through continuous revolution, they will create a new world in which, you know, it all be communist and the capitalists will be destroyed and so on. It didn't happen. On the contrary, Deng Xiaoping comes back and he, he compromises. And what has happened in China was in a strange way, uh, an acceptance that what capitalist technology, capitalist finance, capitalist economy, the free market economy and so on, was a necessary stage which they cannot avoid. They must go through it. And what they do is they will go towards socialism, but socialism at the end of a successful Capital, capital, capital stage, capitalist stage, and become a socialist state, but with Chinese characteristics. You see how they are turning their minds back to it. Now, the reason, that, again, is very simple. The simple thing is that they realize they have 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years of, in their minds, continuous history, brought about by the Shiji, Han Shu, and all the dynastic histories, 24 dynastic histories, until the 16, until 1644. If they had the Qing history, they bring it out to 1911, and then they have the Republic, and then the People's Republic, then the whole thing will be lined up again. And this is why I wrote this book called China Reconnects. It reconnects its present to the whole of the length of their history and reconnects it with the new world order in which they will join the rest of the world in accepting a, a situation in which they will remain what they are, with all their Chinese characteristics built into 
a new state, which is a multinational state, but it is, a, it is not an empire. So these are the kind of things that they're thinking about. So right now, all the Chinese historians are engaged, even today, struggling with the idea of China as defined by the West and China as the Chinese understood it, and how to reconcile the things so that it can be a continuous story from the ancient down right down to the present and with a future in which the Chinese idea of the great believers in the idea of progress will be based on this materialist technological capitalist system, new market economy system that in the name of globalization and the new world order and so all these things, they have not rejected that, they accept that. They were prepared to go along with it because they think now think they have the confidence to say, we can join it and still be Chinese. And this is what they hope to do. But in order to do that, they've had to rewrite history several times. They rewrote history after 1911 down to 1949. After 1949, they rewrote history to fit in in the Soviet system of the Soviet bloc. After Deng Xiaoping came back, after Mao Zedong's death, they tried to rewrite history but don't know where to go. And as they rewrite their history now, they say it must be based on the fact that they had continuity of 2,000, 3,000 years of history. And you cannot remove that. You cannot discard that. You cannot ignore that. This is part and parcel of the Chinese history that will go on into the future. So the word now is no, no longer even discovery, imagination, or invention. It is a willingness now to rewrite history again. And this is something that I think we have to think about because the way I think about it now is that I think all of us have to rewrite history continually as the world changes, as the situation changes and demands different things. I don't know how it would apply to India or the Arab world or the Muslim world or the Christian world in the future. But I know that the Chinese are up against this in a very direct way because now they feel that all the world outside are being made to try and contain China to say that in the end, China must go back to China proper, the China of only the Han people. All the other people must be broken off so that the, the, the law that empires must end up as nations will prevail. Because that is a, a kind of universal law uh, of history. And therefore, China's turn is because it's the only one left that is essentially inheriting an empire and refusing to go back to, as it were, an, uh, a breakup of all that empire into many, many nation states. And therefore, the job now is to get everybody to make the Chinese accept that this is the way it ought to be. I'll end on that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Wang, uh, for seamlessly uh, you know, tying together so many elements uh, of historiography, uh, writing, rewriting, discovering, and connecting each of these to various uh, episodes uh, across uh, centuries. Uh, and I was particularly uh, impressed with the explanation of uh, China and India being two different models uh, of how uh, European imperial powers uh, engaged uh, both in colonizing but also in writing their histories uh, in, in very different fashion. Uh, I have requests uh, from some people here, Dr. Mahesh Singh, Dr. Parvez Ali, Manikam and Dr. Silky Kaur. Uh, I only see Dr. Silky Kaur on my screen so I will request that uh, people who wish to make a comment or ask a question uh, should switch on their screen uh, uh, video so that I can see that they are with us. And ideally uh, raise uh, electronic hand if they can. Uh, otherwise just physical hand uh, the way I'm doing. So just if you can't do electronic hand, just show me the hand like this. Uh, sure, in case I miss you once, uh, you may have to then try again because electronic hand stays on your screen and that makes it easier for me to uh, invite you to make your comment or ask your question. Uh, I see now two people of uh, the uh, four people who made a request. Uh, okay, Dr. Varghis, I have noted that. Bagish, I have noted your name also. Uh, but let me begin by asking some of my own questions 
because usually I am uh, someone uh, so far in all our 26 talks, I have allowed myself not to ask and let participants uh, ask first. But I'm breaking that rule. I'm very tempted to ask you things, uh, a couple of very quick things. Uh, the first one is to continue with that uh, mention of difference of how European uh, countries colonized India which was a combination of several uh, princely states, uh, uh, as you mentioned, and the imagination at least uh, of both Europeans and uh, perhaps also Chinese of China being an empire, a Qing empire at that time. Uh, was that something that deterred European countries for several uh, decades and centuries to physically uh, occupy China? Uh, was that the explanation that you see as a a dominant explanation as to why China was not physically occupied the way India was physically occupied. A second also is a relatively more contemporaneous and you uh, perhaps uh, did not mention that part of your great research on overseas Chinese. And the stereotype is that overseas Chinese are now far more enthusiastic in engaging China uh, because of rise of China. Is that your understanding or are there other, you know, more perennial elements of the linkages that overseas Chinese share with China that uh, keeps them connected to China? Uh, because normally, you know, we believe that it's the rise of China that makes every Chinese feel excited. And I want to, you know, go a little further slightly on the mention of Chunko. Other than Tinsha, uh, Chunko, uh, you mentioned, was not generally seen as a European territorial nation state. In Indian case also, uh, the father of nation Gandhi has talked about Swaraj and Swades, uh, self-rule and not necessarily nation but homeland. Uh, so the territoriality was missing in both Chinese and Indian understanding of who we are. Uh, but Chung Kuo was, uh, you know, gradually evolving into a, a kind of a territorial nation state. You know, for example, today's uh, Phutumha would describe Chungku as a nation, which is normally connotation is territorial. So how that evolution happened uh, from Chungku being only an idea around the emperor uh, to becoming gradually a territorial uh, nation state. Uh, what was that evolution? So sorry, I'm taking advantage of being the convener and chair today. Uh, but please, if you can uh, respond to some of these very uh, uh, simple, I suppose, uh, inquisitiveness on my part and then we'll open up to all the participants. Those are, those are very difficult questions as you can imagine. I mean, I, I, for your first question, let me say that it is so difficult because the nuances and the, and the subtleties and thinking on both countries and India and China uh, do not come together very easily. I mean, it is one of the reasons why I would say on the whole, the Chinese people and China as a state have great difficulty understanding India. I think Indians probably have equal difficulty, but probably Indians have a better chance to understand China because China in, in many ways is much more straightforward. It's, uh, you can actually see the outlines of China and Chinese history uh, very sharply decline, uh, defined quite early on and clearer. Even though there are many difficulties, it is still clear, easier to grasp what is China than for a Chinese or any outsider to grasp what is India. I, I, I'm pretty certain that Indians understand India in a way which non-Indians don't fully grasp. And that's something that I can't explain. All I can say is that that has always been so in my lifetime. I've seen it in so many different ways. And I share that bewilderment when I use the word India. Because when I go to uh, Tamil Nadu or uh, Madras or go to Bombay, or Delhi, I, I, it, I feel very, it's very different for me. I don't like quite, able, I'm not always able to explain the difference. And certainly Calcutta, it looks completely different from other parts of India, Kerala and Calcutta. And then I remember this why I was so fascinated was that uh, I found that uh, the most lively and uh, talented communists were in Calcutta and in uh, in uh, Cochin or Calcutta. <laughs> and so on. 
Southern Co. anyway, or Canada. And they were so different, but they, they were pro produced some of the most brilliant communist leaders in India at the time. So that was a curiosity in my mind. So I would say that the first question is that, that differences have pre prevented the two peoples from really understanding each other. And it remains so to this day. My dear friend, uh, Tan Sen Sen has tried several times to explain this and he explains it about as well as anybody can, in fact, better than anybody else I know. But yet, I don't think he fully explains it all. There's still much that is left unclear. And so your second question, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a historical question. Because as you, as you know, there's no such thing as an overseas Chinese in the Ming and Qing period. They never recognized them. They say, if you're Chinese, you leave the country, it's just bad luck, it's bad, too bad, you know? And you're not one of us, if you, if you do that, you're, First of all, you're not filial. You left your parents uh, behind. You wandered off, and you're certainly not loyal to the emperor by wandering off and and, and working for some foreign uh, foreign company or foreign government. So they were treated as if not exiles, if not outlaws, or certainly not not recognized as Chinese, and they couldn't care for them. And when the Chinese got uh, massacred in Manila or in Jakarta and so on. Uh, the Qing dynasty knew about it, but uh, the Ming dynasty too knew about it, Qing dynasty knew about it, but they did nothing about it. Because it's, they, 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 it's, it's, their, it's their fault. They went out there, uh, you know, what's got to do with us? Now that, all the way down to 1893, before they finally changed their policy and recognized that these people of Chinese descent or parentage and the, the children of Chinese fathers, incidentally, not mothers, Chinese fathers, you know, that, that's how paternalistic it was. The children of Chinese fathers were recognized as Chinese in, in that. And it was not in 1909 that it was finally clearly defined. So it's as late as that. And since then, however, things have changed. Because these Chinese out there, of course, when they were unprotected by anybody, were, some were adventurous and clever, they survived. Others were bullied. And everywhere they were treated as uh, outsiders and there nobody to protect them. So they had to protect themselves. They formed themselves in little cliques and community centers and, and, and just, just get desperately hung together in order to survive. And that's what happened. And that made them even more unpopular because they hung, to, hung together. But they hung together because they didn't know how, how else they could survive. So these were contradictions which uh, lasted for a long, long time. But then once the government said, we recognize you as we're supposed to protect you, oh, of course they accepted it. They were delighted. Somebody now cares for us. So in any way, they looked around and saw when the other people have nationalities, their governments cared for their nationals, their citizens. The British looked after the British, the French looked after the French, the Dutch made sure that every Dutchman gets all the privileges. And that's how the Chinese would see it. But we got nobody, no, nothing from China. So when the Chinese Qing government finally gave them some attention, they were delighted. So they're very proud, you know, now we're protected. But then China was very weak. And for a hundred years, the Chinese were bashed around by everybody, you know, and they lost every war. <laughs> they lost against the Europeans, against the Japanese, they invasions by everybody. The Japanese invaded them all the way down. And then the communists took over and the you know, Russians everywhere. This is how it was perceived. So they went through periods of, shall we say, great uncertainty as to what to do. So when, in the course of all that, they, they made choices, they made decisions. Some Chinese chose to assimilate and become part of new nations and forget about being part of China. But there always a residue of Chinese who felt the least they could do is to preserve their culture, their own religion, their own uh, language, their own customs and so on, and somehow managed to keep that. So all they want was some kind of autonomy inside a, a nation state which they are prepared to be loyal to, but like the state in, in exchange of their loyalty to allow them to keep their culture and their language and some of the customs. So they made the deals. So these are some of the original overseas Chinese down to very recently. But what has happened since the opening up of China after Deng Xiaoping was that now new kinds of Chinese are moving out of China to live abroad, completely different from the past. They're not going out as laborers and, and coolies and just re e eking out a living. They're going out as university graduates, as top scholars, as being uh, extraordinarily successful businessmen, entrepreneurs, representing 
uh, uh, the big companies in China, and they're settling down and being active elsewhere. And some of them, of course, with their children growing up there, <clears throat> wondering whether they should return to China or not. In that sort of context, the Chinese government is quite openly and without actually making a secret of it, saying, we want you back. But they're really addressing, as I can understand, they're really addressing these people who are very well educated and, and something to offer to China that the Chinese need and the Chinese want them back. Yet I don't think the Chinese, are, the Chinese government is particularly interested in all those Chinese who are, who are really loyal to their own countries and assimilated, which are the majority. They're not that interested in them. But what happens is when they speak of welcoming the Chinese home, they find it difficult to, draw, to distinguish in the languages. They use the same language to say that, of course, all you Chinese are welcome back. They put it in those terms. But knowing very well that some of those Chinese, they don't want them back. I mean, some of them are so hostile to the Communist Party. They don't want them back. The others are totally, totally assimilated to local uh, conditions and local uh, languages and cultures and religions and so on. Uh, they, the Chinese government don't, don't, don't care whether they come back or not. But what they do care are those several millions of them now, several millions, maybe, I don't know the exact number because these figures are hard to establish exactly, but there are several millions of them now who are extremely well qualified, extremely talented, learned a lot from the West today, who have gone from China having been educated in China with full degrees, and now the Chinese would like them to go back and help China. And that I, that I, I think that's understandable, but how to distinguish they, they, they find it difficult. I think, I think India has the same problem you talk about. Overseas India. You can't say you are, you are born there and virtually an American and those who are recent there and still have family and great close connections back in India. So you too have to, but you also are pretty vague about it. So it goes to show that this is something that all countries, if they want their people outside to return, they'll have difficulty in wording it in such a way that they can find the ones they want and the ones they don't want, they can separate them, but they can't word it in such a way. So that's, that's, yeah, that's something in common. Thank you, sir. Indeed, uh, the first Prime Minister of India that you were audience to, as you mentioned, uh, in his initial speeches had said the same thing to uh, people of Indian origin in other countries when India became independent. Uh, he had suggested that they should continue to live in their uh, host country uh, because that was their home and for a long time India had the same policy of uh, you know, sort of not really becoming the spokesperson for uh, people of Indian origin outside. Uh, gradually of course that policy changed and uh, in a big way of course towards turn of the century when uh, Prime Minister Bajpai uh, started overseas uh, Indians uh, connect much more institutionalized in, in much more institutionalized manner. Uh, and I think so story is a, a bit of a, a similar Chinese uh, being a little ahead, even in this case of engaging overseas Chinese. Uh, I have now five requests already noted. Uh, so I will first request uh, Dr. Parvez Ali Mahaisa to uh, make his intervention. Please unmute yourself. Thank you, Professor Dr. Sabaran and Dr. Reena to reconnect after our gathering at uh, Chulalongkorn University, Bangkok. I'm equally uh, thankful to Professor Dr. Gungu Wang for his uh, deep insights on the Chinese history. My question to Professor Wang is, with the Chinese increasing investment in South Asia, Pakistan in particular, there is a growing perception that China could recolonize the region. Do you think that China has also inherited a colonial mindset? Thank you. I don't know of course, what the Chinese actually think, but my understanding is that the, the Chinese uh, got close to Pakistan at a time when relations with India were tense and the Pakistanis were also felt the need for getting very close to China and the Pakistanis were also, Pakistanis were also quite actively uh, uh, wooing or getting close to, to the Chinese. So both sides were, they're not a question of Chinese 
drawing the Pakistan towards them is Pakistan was also looking for, 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 for external aid from every direction in their eyes to protect themselves against, against India. And I think this is how, how has that has been explained to me. Uh, right now, I think the, the Chinese are interested, very much interested, the fact that the Pakistan do depend on China a fair bit, I understand. And the Chinese are interested because they're very interested in protecting what is a new phenomenon for China. I didn't manage to say something about it earlier on, but I think it is, it is a very important change in China, trans, complete transformation of Chinese history. And that is their economy now actually depends on maritime trade. Never in the past has the Chinese economy depended so much on maritime trade. The, the capitalist free market economy is largely supported by cheap transportation by sea. And the transportation by sea for both looking out for markets as well as getting resources from outside has become so essential to China's rapid modernization of the last 40 years. The economic so-called miracle in China would not have happened, could not have happened without the opening to the sea. Now this is new. And their dependence on the sea Actually, they were dependent to some extent, but the, the, the extent to which they depend on the sea today is unbelievable. They, to them, they could kill, destroy the Chinese economy if they were blocked at sea. And this, only one power can do that, they know that, and that's the United States. The United States Navy, or in fact, the Western Navy, but the United States Navy alone could, could block and the South China Sea and the, the way into the Indian Ocean, to, uh, for that matter, the Pacific, the Pacific entirely dominated by the United States Navy. The Chinese accept that, they cannot change that. But in the, the other parts of the world, they want to have a share in it, to make sure that they can get to the oil of the Middle East in the old days. I don't know whether they'll depend to the same extent, but that's what they had in mind. That's why they had to reach out and to, to Europe. They want to get to Europe to, to depend on, you know, this Belt and Road thing, which depends on the also land, they discovered that although it, can, it is possible, but it will not be worth their while. It's not going to be profitable to, to depend on the, the express fast trains to Europe across 10 different countries, 10 different borders, expensive land, all the problems of interstate relations. Whereas by sea, it's open. You can, you can bypass all the problems. So they, it really is a dependence on the sea, which had never been a problem for China before. So given this problem, given the fact that the Straits of Malacca or the Straits of Singapore for that matter, can be blocked like that, and the Chinese trade would be just killed off if, 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 uh, if necessary, so to speak. And the Chinese will be absolutely caught like the Japanese in the funniest sort of way, this is exactly what happened, why Japan went to the war in 1941. The Japanese didn't want to fight the, the West. They were quite happy to try and take over China if possible. But in the end, they, you know, they, as, as you know, there was an embargo on all the oil from Indonesia, from Dutch East Indies, and the Americans imposed the embargo uh, at that point. And that was over that, the Japanese made a desperate, to, to me anyway, a desperate attempt to, to open up the thing by attacking to try and clear the, 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 the American Navy. And it was a futile, it was absolutely a, a desperate effort. It was an absolutely hopeless adventure. Anyway, that's what they do. The Chinese have learned from that. You can't do that. You, you have to find some way of making sure that your lines are at sea must be generally open. So it is quite ironic when the Americans talk about the South China Sea, they all talk about freedom of navigation. But actually, the Chinese need freedom of navigation even more desperately than any, any, anybody else. So when they're in that condition, and they're now looking for all sorts of ways around the Arctic, over land, and so they, they're trying to get through Burma to the Indian Ocean, they're going to get to Pakistan to the Indian Ocean, they, they're very friendly with Iran, and hoping for that, to make sure that their energy supplies and their and the market to Europe through the Suez Canal and so on, all that could somehow be protected in some way. Now, I'm not, I will not claim that that is all that is on the China mind. I do not know. But what I'm saying, this part is logical. It makes good sense to me. I can see it. If they don't have it, if somebody blocks the Straits of Malacca, and Straits of Sunda is not very useful, a very long way around, blocks the Straits of it, it's very, very tough for the Chinese. And it's not hard to block the Straits of Malacca or the Straits of Sunda. 
And for the Chinese in the Pacific, what can the Chinese do if the Americans really want to stop them from crossing the Pacific? The Pacific? You know, all that way. So in that sense, if the Chinese economy continues to depend on maritime freedom of, of navigation, then they are pretty desperate. So keeping friendly with Burma and Pakistan is essential. Since they can't keep friendly with both India and Pakistan to the same extent, they have to depend on somebody to let them through. And they're not gonna get through India. And the Bangladesh is no use to them because it's, it's got no port to speak of and it's, it's in terrible condition anyway. So, so that now I, I see that over Sitra in, in, the, in, the, in the Rohingya territory, both the Indians and the, and the Chinese are, are, are there, and the Myanmar had bought a submarine for me. And so you can see that this is a game that everybody knows what it's all about, but it's, it actually derives from the fact that on the one hand, India would feel insecure if the Chinese were too powerful in the Indian Ocean. On the other hand, the Chinese are desperate if they don't have access to the Indian Ocean, the economy will suffer greatly. Thank you. Uh, I see some names. Uh, Shashi Bhatti also requested, but I would like to see that um, if you switch on your video, then I see you on my screen. Then I will know that I can invite you uh, to make your comment that you are with us. Thank you, Shashi. I can see you now. But let me first go to uh, Vignesh Ram, Dr. Vignesh. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for uh, this arranging this lecture, and thank you, Professor uh, Pang for this fantastic uh, take. I'm Dr. Vignesh Ram. Um, I'm a political risk analyst based in Bangalore. Um, and uh, I am a PhD in Southeast Asian history. So uh, that's what brought me to also to your lecture here. And I thank you for organizing Professor Swaran and Dr. Reena. Uh, uh, Professor Wang, uh, my question is actually on the concept of uh, Nusantara. Uh, so that forms a central part of the identity of what Indonesia uh, brought about. And it became very nationalistic in the, uh, the origins, I mean, during the Indonesian freedom struggle. Mm -hmm. And uh, probably that was one of the reasons, uh, if I'm right, that, you know, uh, it was not, it didn't find a lot of adaptation across and uh, the whole maritime Southeast Asia to say of. So, um, in 1967, uh, if I can note right, uh, that concept was, uh, it became a more of a political concept rather than, you know, a nationalistic driven concept from Indonesia. So uh, what is the reason you think that this concept did not form a more of an identity uh, within Southeast Asia? Is it the regionalism which uh, started from 1967 with ASEAN? And then it became more of a normative adaptation within ASEAN, the Indonesian approach. Do you think that was the reason why uh, this didn't form a central part of the identity uh, calculus and Indonesia's thrust uh, within Southeast Asia? Thank you. Uh, this, this one has got so many levels of, uh, of uh, relationships that it's, I don't know where to begin. But let me say, the, uh, underlying it all, is what outsiders would see as obvious, that there is such a people called the Malayo-Polynesian people who share the same language. Uh, the further ones, of course, became Polynesian and became, uh, uh, they went to, to uh, Madagascar, and so they, they, they moved in different directions. But the core of them have become Malays, as in a general, the word Malay has been applied to all the territories, all the way from Northern, Northern Sumatra, Northern Tegarache, right across to the Philippines, to the Northern Philippines, and would include the people, indigenous people of Taiwan, and all the way, and some of the indigenous people in, in or more or less indigenous people in, in, uh, in the Champa, the old, old Champa on the mainland of Southeast Asia. These were Malay people. So Nusantara, in a general, broad sense, could include all the people of the islands, who in the island world of, uh, of this Malay world of the islands. But what happened over the centuries, of course, there were differences. There were in the beginning as the Indian influence was so powerful. It was a Hindu, Buddhist, uh, the realm of uh, what uh, Oliver 
waters, you should call them a number of Mandala states, which are related to one another, but deeply influenced by India, both Hindu and Buddhist. So that was their common thing. And there were no borders. There were no even, even sharp borders of any kingdoms. Uh, that we know that there's no historical record to show that there were any borders. They were just, they just moved freely, as far as we know. And uh, that remained until gradually the development of one of them became very powerful. The most populous and the wealthiest, the Java. Java became extremely powerful. So that in Java became some of the states began to form in Java. And the rest were slower, a bit slower, but they also began to shape up. But these distinctions and the language itself became more differentiated. And then the type of structure that the Javanese took, for example, was much more Hindu, much more Indian than some of the others, some of the coastal maritime little ports and so on, but did not look to India quite as much. And in fact, were quite quickly, with once the uh, Islamic world created and the Islamic merchants came uh, east from, uh, from Arabia, Arab world, the Muslim merchants were doing much better in the trade, whereas the Hindus on the whole were not as great traders in comparison. So, and, and over time, in ways which are to me, for me till now, very difficult to explain, uh, Islam took over in all the ports, the maritime ports, it came to the hands of the Muslim traders, not, not, nothing political, they were all mainly just trading people, but controlling the, the ports, while the structures of government were much more Hinduized, whether it's Bali or East, East Java and so on. And, uh, and that somehow the break came and the period of great confusion on the, that's why the Javanese state itself from Majapahit to, to all the Muslim part of Java was a quite a traumatic thing for them. And the Dutch, by that time the Dutch had come, so it became very confusing. But the, to end the story, if I may be cut through all the middle part, the end of the story was, the fact was, the Dutch took large parts of that Lusantara, but couldn't, didn't want the rest. They took all the key parts, the rich parts like Java, and then Malacca, and the bits of Sumatra, and a bit of uh, further east in the Celebes and Surabesi and so on. But they didn't want the Hudlus. There were very, relatively few Dutchmen, it's a small country. It was straining them beyond their means, so they took what they could control. But they left behind a lot of other places. For example, uh, is what Islam had gone further west, far west with the Malacca Empire, Islam had moved further, all the, far east, all the way to the Philippines, to the Mindanao, the Dutch didn't follow them. They just kept more to the Javanese side. At the same time, and what was uh, remarkable, was that the British got interested. The British were not interested to begin with because they were busy keeping them busy in India. That was enough to keep them very busy. But when the British got caught in the tea trade with China and they needed that trade, and they needed to get through from India to China, they were using India as a basis for buying and selling in China to tea with the opium for India and so on. When that became important to them, the British took an interest and somehow they managed to get Penang and Singapore. Now, why the Dutch did not, were not interested, it's a good question because the Dutch were in Malacca they were in, they, maybe they thought that was enough, but they were in Malacca. They didn't bother with the two ends of the Straits of Malacca. They were controlling the center. That was enough. So they didn't bother. So the British took the northern part and then eventually took the southern part, squeezed the Dutch out of Malacca. But that became very important because once the British realized that Singapore was crucial to their trade with China and from Calcutta, to Guangzhou, as it were, this Singapore became vital, and this was before, before Hong Kong came along, it was vital before the opening of China, then they, they wanted to take the territory. So what, what they did was they negotiated the Anglo-Dutch Treaty, which drew a line in the middle of the Straits of Malacca. Now, can you imagine anybody doing that today? Uh, with, you know, and then they drew, you know, and the interesting thing is that that line has stayed. It's a loyal, it's a line. With both sides agree, sacred line. The, uh, the Indonesian and the Malaysian government will not touch that. That's the why. That is that's interesting. Now your Nusantara was thus broken up by the British and the Dutch. But by the simple fact that the Johor Empire was weakened enough, and while they were weak and fighting among each other among the islands, the British sided one side, the Dutch sided the other side, 
and somehow the British maneuvered themselves into Singapore and the Johor and, and the Malay Peninsula became, as it were, the British side of the Straits of Malacca. And once that line was drawn, Nusantara was broken into two. And that line remains today. And why is it so important? And that is that Indonesia, from the very beginning, as you described the Indonesian Revolution, when they took over to conceive of the whole of Indonesia, of course, they were right to take over from what the Dutch had. That, that's their argument. But they could argue for taking over what the British had. That's one thing. Number one, that the British refused to accept that. And they said, you, you take from the Dutch, that's, that's your problem. That's a different problem. But the other side, which was even just, just as important, if not more so, was that there were royal houses, kingdoms, monarchs in Sumatra, which are exactly the same as the Malay states in, in the Malay Peninsula. They were relatives, they were cousins, they were intermarried with, among the aristocrats on both sides of the Straits of Malacca was very well known. They were Malays on both sides. And to this day, Malays all the way down to uh, Palembang and, and down to Rialinga, they're basically the same people, speak a different variety of Malay, but they are very close. But when Indonesia became a, a republic, they got rid of all the royal families of the Malay, or Malay royal families across one side. The British, however, protected the Malay royalties of the Malay Peninsula. And once you do that, constitutionally, all those Malay states, monarchies, are now constitutionally recognized, and they are, each of them are supposed to be more or less sovereign in its own terms, and, and come together as a federation. No. Then they are totally dependent on the British to protect them, in fact, irony, to protect them from the Indonesians. I mean, I, they won't put it in quite in those words, but that's in effect. What happened was the monarchies, the Malay rulers of the Malay Peninsula now needed British help to survive. Otherwise, the Republican Indonesians will simply get rid of it. And there are many Malays I know in my, my, my generation who didn't care for the monarchy and were quite happy to, to, to be part of Malayu Raya, you know, greater Malay world and so on. But that was not to be because the Malay rulers were constitutionally the legitimate sovereigns of more or less protected sovereign states. Now, in that context, your Nusantara is cut off. And of course, on the other side, the Spanish having taken off large chunks of those islands and something like 10,000 of them, more than 10,000 of them, and then kept it and the Americans took over and kept kept the Muslims in check in, in the Mindanao and stopped them from expanding. Since then, it's been a completely different world. But the Catholic Church has ensured that the other remnant part of, the remaining part of uh, Nusantara it belongs to a different world. It belongs in a way the Pacific world and not really quite uh, the Indo-Pacific South, South Asian world. So that sort of explains it, but you can see how complex the layers of it, many layers of it. Thank you. Now, I was looking at time that it is almost uh, two hours that Professor Wan has been sharing his thoughts with us. Uh, and I wondered what is happening to his lunch uh, because uh, we started uh, around 11.30 and he came and joined us at 11.20. So uh, I believe he hasn't had his uh, lunch as of now. Uh, so the last two quick uh, questions will be the first one from Shashi Bhatti. Uh, of course, we'll also in, we'll have three questions now. Uh, so, uh, Shashi Bhatti, please quickly introduce yourself and ask your question. Uh, hello, sir. I'm a student of Sri Ram College of Commerce, and it's good to listen to you. So, you no, know, we have talked about the empires and how they broke into the nations, and about the Asian countries that got independent. So, during that time, we have the concept of nationalism that was very much prevalent. But then we have the concept of, you know, uh, coming of globalization. But in recent times, we have seen the, uh, that there are trust issues and hostilities have been increasing between the countries. And, you know, this has led to, again, coming of this concept of nationalism and nations. So, you know, I just wanted to know about the, what is your opinion? And do you think, is, is it going to lead to any humanity crisis in coming years or going to fade away as we cannot simply deny the world order of 
you know, this interconnection. So, yeah. I, I, I think that's a very profound question because it is a very deep one that affects the whole world. What is, what is a nation? Uh, we took it for granted. In my, I grew up almost taking the word for granted that it was the most normal thing that everybody should have a nation because you looked at all the European nations, they seemed to be normal and they determined the history. The history of the world should be written in those terms, in terms of nations. And by the time I became a student, the United Nations had been created. A whole new world was really consist of nations, each one sovereign and theoretically equal in the eyes of the United Nations. They're all equal before God, as it were. Uh, all nations should be equal. Of course, at the same time, of course, I realized this cannot be true. Some, some nations are enormous and some are so tiny. How can they be equal? So we knew that in reality, that's not true. But the idea that they are equal and that they are all to be respected and are sovereign is a brilliant idea. I mean, who can, it's like motherhood, you know, how can you be opposed to that? So I took that for granted. It's only when we look in detail what actually, what, who are the people in the so-called nations. Now in Europe, they had actually defined it very carefully. Most of them were defined based on one language, one religion, and a shared history. The minimal thing they were, all had to have. And you can see in some of those European countries, pretty homogenous. I mean, I was, until very recently, many of those countries literally were just one language, one religion, and a shared country. But where in Asia did we have that? Which state, given the boundaries, was there such homogeneity of one religion and one language? None. As I said, Japan was the closest. Even Japan wasn't so like it. Japan was the closest. And Vietnam had a, something like it, but not quite. The Koreans, not quite. But these are, these are the closest that I can think of. In South Asia, I couldn't think of anything. I, could, I, I mean, I know my, some of them, I hope nobody will take offense. Some of my Bengali friends would like to think of Bengal as a, as a nation. But then he said, Bengal gets divided. And how he got divided? I mean, it's a long story. It's divided by somebody else. They divided the, the thing up way back. You know? So, and yet to me in India, anyway, that was the one state that, that when, I, when I was young and innocent, I thought that was probably some closest to a nation state inside India. But you can see how the words are troublesome. So as for Malaya, it was probably the worst example. I mean, and they were different. Even among the Malays, they were very different. They were united in the end because they were united against all the non-Malays to in order to survive. But actually among themselves, they were very different. They, they didn't trust each other. They, they, each of them was supposed to loyal to their own sultans. You know, they didn't even share that. So it took them a long time, even among the Malays. And among the Chinese, there were different dialects and groups. They were not united at all. Again, they were united only because, again, the ethnic differences, the ethnic boundaries forced them to unite in ethnic terms or almost racial terms. And that's very sad because so you have a nation and the inside the nation, you have different ethnicities behaving like little nations among themselves and distrusting each other and not able to, not able to think of themselves as one nation. I don't know how you can resolve this, but yet this is what happened to almost all of us. I mean, I, I don't want to name all the countries, but I would say every country in Southeast Asia certainly faces that. I would say even most countries in South Asia faces something like that, but maybe not as bad as some of, not so serious like in Southeast Asia. But that is, that's a reality. And China, of course, they themselves said they had 56 nationalities. And for God's sake, how do they solve that one? So now they're trying to de deny that. They're trying to say, no, no, there's only one nation that the Chinese is the Zhonghua Minzu, is the Chinese nation. That is to say, everybody within the boundaries of this map of China are Chinese. Uh, and you can be Han Chinese, but they're all Chinese. But that's, that's a political decision. But do people really feel it? I don't know. I doubt they, they do. And I think, don't see how they can do it very quickly. But then what we try to resolve it by, or find, find some way out of it, is to do something like regionalism. That's one way. To get the regions so where you have common interests. You may not have common language or religion, but you have common interests, and that at least could iron out some of the problems, and so on. But that doesn't always work. I mean, look at Europe. 
having become so many nations, trying to become one again, a United States of Europe, is almost impossible. You can see, I mean, something like Brexit that could happen. And, you know, and even within England, you can have four little states. I mean, I don't know, the Scottish are not happy. And, uh, and the Barcelona doesn't care for the rest of Spain, all that sort of thing. Now, so even within those established nations, they have that problem, not to say the rest of us. So how do we go on with this? So we try to escape the problem by either regionalism or now some people say globalization. We globalize and we think of ourselves as a human race. We're only one race, we have shared problems, climate change, pandemics, you know, all, all these things. And then, then you stop thinking of ethnic groups, you think of our common survival as human beings on this earth that we share. This is one thing we do share. We share this earth, it's getting smaller, and as we get smaller, we get closer together. The transportation today, communications, telecommunication, the way we are, every second we are in touch with the rest of the world. Surely we can be globalized so that we stop thinking of ourselves in ethnic terms. That's an, another idea. But what has happened is that globalization has simply done, created new problems. It's created the fact that the whole really globalized people are a small one or two percent of the world's richest, most uh, best educated and uh, best position, privileged people at the top. And then down below, masses of millions, billions of poor people, in between people are struggling to be a middle class, one way, trying to prevent themselves from going down and still aspiring to go up. And in the end, you have, in a way, recapturing a kind of class differences. And then you have creating different kinds of class differences, you have differences in gender, all these things, other differences come out to, in the globalized world. So maybe you struggle to away, get away from this national, national ethnicity problem, into a different set of inequalities and unfairness and so on. And maybe you can try, try again in some other way. I don't know, but I'm not very optimistic to be quite frank. No, sir, you're right. And, uh, these are nation states uh, constantly being uh, questioned, redefined. And uh, luckily, uh, Bengal nation is uh, not an, an issue that disturbs, disturbs anyone in India. Uh, though Bengalis have had um, this imagination of golden Bangla nation and that would then of course also have Bay of Bengal and whole of Andaman and Nekovas. So it's a very large territory over which uh, this uh, linguistically driven identity uh, of a community has been spread around. Uh, but uh, that is uh, not a political movement, so mention of it is, is fine. And they are only a linguistically driven uh, community, which is having one country called Bangladesh. Uh, but uh, we also have a large population on the Indian side. Let me now request we have a participant from Southeast Asia, from Myanmar, Dr. Khin Mong So. Please unmute yourself and uh, make your intervention. Thank you very much, uh, sir. Uh, I really uh, benefited uh, from this uh, inspiring lecture. Uh, also, uh, the professor went remind me of my visit to Lee Kuan Yew School of uh, Public Policy, and I found his photo in big uh, the uh, frame, uh, the golden frame, and also I learned many uh, quotations. And uh, when uh, quotation said uh, Japanese uh, entrepreneur Mr. Honda said, "You you has nothing to do with age." Uh, it is uh, an issue of mind over matter. If you don't uh, mind, it doesn't matter. Now I better understand uh, from the professor when uh, the inspiring lecture. My question is that uh, amid a, a, a global power transition, uh, theoretically, uh, the ASEAN uh, countries are not to take uh, the sides of man big power. Uh, if some of the ASEAN nation uh, take the side. What will be the future of the ASEAN? Uh, this is my question to Professor Wen. Thank you, sir. Uh, I, I think there are 10 governments and 10 sets of officers out there meeting, I don't know, hundreds of times every year trying to sort out <laughs> what, what ASEAN should be doing. And I wish them luck. I think it's extremely important because they have no choice. I mean, all 10 countries are relatively small. There's only one big one, Indonesia, 
And Indonesia has got so many problems because it's such a big country of islands. I mean, and this is an extraordinary country. I mean, I think it's something like 17,000 islands, most of which are in, most of which are inhabited. And, uh, and how to keep that into, into, into one country, uh, looking after everybody's interest, is, is a major problem which will engage uh, leaders for a long time to come. So there's not, it's totally understandable why they're much more concerned with their own problems and don't think much about ASEAN. And they only think of ASEAN when they worry about being divided and being, as it were, taken apart, split apart by, by the powers that are trying to impose their will on, on this, this region that we call Southeast Asia. And they, because they learn to appreciate that uh, if they don't get together, they'll be, they be, they be, they be pulled apart very easily. So they know that. And they're trying, they've been trying now for a long time to do that. But as you know, to begin with, there are actually two lots of ASEAN. The first lot of the first six countries and the last four are themselves very different. Not only that they're very different and came at different times, but they really have different roots in what they mean by a region. I mean, the mainland Southeast Asians have a history of inter interlocked history of uh, 2000 years, which link up the Cambodians, Vietnamese, uh, Laotians, Thais, and, 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 and Myanmar in, in ways which don't concern the rest of Asia, the Nusantara countries that we're talking about at all. They're, they're separate issues. And now we're trying to bring them together to have them share a same fate, a same future. Uh, it's easier to talk in theory, but in practice, it's extremely hard. The only country that can probably do that is Thailand, because Thailand faces both ways. It, it does have a sea and it does have related to the Malay Peninsula and the Malay world uh, quite, come quite early on. Uh, but for the rest, uh, there's no connection. The connection from, from Myanmar is much more with Yunnan in the north and India uh, and, uh, and Pakistan uh, and Bangladesh on the other side uh, and Thailand. But so they, what connection can you make between Myanmar and the Philippines, it's, it's uh, imaginary. You have to imagine their interests because it's very hard to pin them down. And even for Indonesia to, to understand what is happening in, 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 in Myanmar, it's very difficult, totally understandable. And why, why should the people up in, say, for example, uh, among the, uh, uh, the northern peoples in the Shan states and, uh, and uh, so on, uh, think about uh, what's happening in Mindanao? I mean, it just, just doesn't cannot click, it just will not click. And I, I think it's understandable. So the leaders have to be very patient. They have constantly, they are really depending on a small group of people who are officials, who are in a way committed by certain realities, committed to make this thing work, no matter what. Somehow they're gonna make it work. But for the rest of the population in Southeast Asia, I think it's gonna be very difficult to really get through to them that this is something meaningful. And we know that this is the weakness of ASEAN. The strength of it lies in the fact that it's geopolitically threatened, it feels threatened on all sides. And that forces it to think in, in, in very adventurous and take initiatives and, and try to be, try to be uh, really uh, uh, smart to survive, or be a smart nation to survive. So given that fact, which will not change, and the fact that now it is now in the middle of a so-called new region of Indo-Pacific of strategic interest to both the United States on one side, India on the other, Australia on one side, Japan on the other, and, and China at the, at the northern end of the South China Sea. Once it's become even more central, if the, if the strategic area is called Indo-Pacific, with the Indian Ocean, and right in between is the Southeast Asia. Whether you like it, I mean, the Southeast Asians like to talk about the centrality of Southeast Asia. Nobody understands what that centrality means. But geographically, whether they like it or not, they are actually in the middle of the Indo-Pacific uh, interaction who has to be through, especially if we're going to talk about maritime relationship. It's, it's through Southeast Asia. Now, in that sense, you can see uh, in your case, your, your country's case, in Myanmar's case, is a very special case because your problems are really primarily land-based. Your, your, your real concerns are really on China on one side, India a little bit on Southeast Asia, but basically it's, it's these two. Whereas on the other side, 
they're not interested in the other part at all. I mean, to be quite frank, they're interested in the Pacific uh, and much more concerned with their north, with Taiwan, Japan, Korea, China, and of different um, origins. So you go back to how it was, I think it's been a wonderful progress so far to have reached the point that it has reached. We know it's weak, it has all sorts of problems, and then see how much it, it did not manage to do. But if, if you look at the other side, how did they survive so long? It's really a, almost a miraculous. It's a, it's a test of people with tremendous patience, willing to compromise, taking the long-term interests of the, not only of the region, but of the, each, of the, each country, as well as the region at heart, and then playing down their differences in order to try and play up whatever the little that they have in common to make the most of it, to enable it to keep on and on and on and try and negotiate with the outsiders as one unit, one negotiating unit, as it were. It's a fantastic job. I mean, I frankly, I, I, would, not, I would not have the patience, but I watch some of my friends who are involved in this and I give them full marks for that, that tremendous willingness to sacrifice time and energy to try and do something to enable this region to survive intact, keep their own interests in mind all the time while making others understand the importance of Southeast Asia remaining together. That's, that's a terrible <laughs> test. It will go on for a long time. I don't see it being resolved quickly. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Let me quickly squeeze in the very last question, uh, Dr. Silky Kaur, very quickly. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon to all. Thank you, sir, for your talk. Sir, my question to you is that as a historian, how do you think that the leader's personality, their upbringing, their environment, their childhood, their personal thoughts shapes the course of history of a nation? For instance, the history of North Korea is all about Kim regime. How do you see the upbringing of their first leader, Kim Il-sung, played a major role in shaping the history of North Korea? And where do you see the role of today's leaders in shaping future history of the world? Thank you, sir. Oh, this is a big one. Uh, once you get into the question of leadership, the uh, psychology of leadership, the uh, skills that are required for someone to remain a leader. Let me just, I mean, the obvious example today is to look at uh, the situation in the most powerful country in the world, the United States. What kind of a leader uh, does a country produce and uh, how it does it, why it does it, and what it happens to the country if you have one kind of a leader as opposed to another. I mean, never in my life have I seen a shift in leadership so different as that from Obama to Donald Trump. I cannot actually, I don't remember any other country when the leaders can be so different from one country and chosen by the same process. The process is same, same constitution, same electoral process, and so we look at other countries, what chances have we got to produce great leaders? I don't know, I mean, it's also a mystery to me how someone succeeds in becoming a leader. I mean, I take it where I am at the moment, Singapore. How did they produce someone like Lee Kuan Yew who succeeded for 35, 40 years? I mean, from the time he became chief minister to the time he died, it was still his vision that prevailed in Singapore. Now, how did that happen? Is it because Singapore was small, but small and peculiar in a way? Or is it because of his particular quality that just captured what Singapore needed for that time? The right man for the right job at the right time. And it's just a matter of circumstances, as it were. All the stars were aligned in the right way, you know, if you take another approach to it. But I don't know, because I cannot explain it. Why can't other countries produce people like that too? And, and yet, and I come back to this, example because it is the one that's in our, before our eyes. How did it happen to have someone like Obama succeed in the first place? What an extraordinary country to actually elect somebody like him, uh, you know, 
to be to be president. And then, lo and behold, how could it happen to produce a leader like Donald Trump to follow uh, Obama? The same country and, and so on. How did, how, and this is a mystery to me. And I don't blame it on democracy. I think uh, it's not just a democracy. It is the fact that the, the, the question of what is leadership, well, who captures what, 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 what the people outside, the people who vote, want? I mean, the fact is that people might, may laugh at um, uh, Donald Trump and so on, but the man has something like 70 million people voting for him. That's not, uh, that's not an, uh, an accident. Those people who vote for him because he knew how to gain their vote. As a, you call it populism, but populism requires you to understand what makes you popular. How do you capture? How did he get 70 million people to vote for him? Vote for him after all that performance, which we outside find very strange for 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 a leader. And 70 million people are loyal to him. You know, in fact, his gain is more than more than the people who voted him the first time. He's actually got more votes after the last four years. Now that is a mystery. As far as can. how do I explain that to anybody? I certainly can't tell it. How do I explain to my grandson? How could something like that happen? You know, I don't know. I really don't know. And so your question is, I know you had other things in mind, but I just like to say, you touch on something which is actually beyond my comprehension, and I could not tell. And then you look at the whole of history. Leaders appear. Sometimes they come out of nowhere. Sometimes you can expect some people. You can say, ah, I, obviously he's going to be the leader. But other times you say, how the hell did he become a leader? You really don't know. I mean, every country can produce names like that. I mean, where did they come from? I mean, I, I, I really, <laughs> it's extraordinary. I think you go to the whole of history, you can make long lists, you know, or those who you're not surprised they became leaders and those who you're utterly surprised that they ever made it. So when you look at it that way, I think you can become quite philosophical about what is leadership and, and say, Thank God we have a better leader than the other guy at the other stage. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I think it's a very interesting dialectic, uh, whether history makes leaders or leaders make history. And that question remains uh, unsolved. But among several metaphors and concepts that you mentioned that we in Asia learned from Europeans, we also learned uh, from the English is saying that knowledge is power. And I'm saying that because uh, after nearly two and a half hours of this uh, interaction today, uh, I am myself feeling a little hungry and weak. I had a coffee in between. But I can see Professor Wang can continue for another two hours very easily. Oh, no. that, that, that could be my understatement. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that is what uh, inspires us, uh, ambitious that we can continue to be under his guidance as long as possible, as, as long as we, as we wish. Uh, so uh, uh, no words uh, to uh, describe his uh, dedication to uh, serious uh, uh, academic research, uh, such benevolent grooming of uh, by now hundreds of uh, younger and not so younger scholars and inspiring others through his uh, uh, written and spoken words. Uh, so the Chinese sometimes use an expression to describe such intellectuals as national treasure. Uh, I think Professor Wang has uh, now become international treasure, not just the national treasure of any country. Uh, and we are delighted that we have some connection with Professor Wang. Uh, being Asia Fellows, uh, we feel connected and uh, uh, blessed by him all the time. And so it was a great delight that we could have him today with us. Uh, but for the formal vote of thanks, I will request uh, Professor Rina Maba to propose the formal vote of thanks. Uh, thank you, Professor Swaran. As you rightly said that, uh, you know, to have Professor Wong Gangu with us today has really been an absolutely amazing experience. And uh, we just cannot thank you enough uh, for your absolutely brilliant uh, exposition of uh, history from Europe to China to Southeast Asia and the way you have explained uh, the nuances of nation building and nation state and relating it you know to South Asia Southeast Asia the linkages between uh, 
different countries and peoples as well and the importance of maritime trade uh, for China. Uh, thank you so much for that absolutely brilliant uh, lecture. And I think we can just go on uh, listening to you as your students. And as Professor Swaran Singh said that, you know, we really treasure every word that you have said, because it really has so much of in-depth um, understanding because it's your experience and your scholarship which you have brought uh, you know very well into this lecture and we are truly truly grateful uh, thank you so much for your kind indulgence uh, professor wang gangu and we wish you uh, the very best of health and happiness because with your good health uh, you know that we would have possibly another chance to engage with you sometime after a few weeks or months but uh, thank you very much and uh, for our next uh, Wednesday's uh, webinar uh, we are going to look at another part of uh, the globe we are uh, drivers for African growth and transformation is going to be our webinar next Wednesday and the speaker is Dr. Greg Mills director of Brenthurst Foundation and former National Director, South African Institute of International Affairs from South Africa. And uh, we would uh, like to thank uh, all our participants uh, who joined us today, despite uh, your very busy uh, engagements, I'm sure, because it's the morning uh, in South Asia and afternoon in Southeast Asia. And thank you for joining us. I also see Professor Munim Barai, our Asia Fellow, joining us from Japan. So thank you, uh, Professor Munim, for joining us. And thank you to each one for being with us and encouraging us in our efforts. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you for joining. We look forward to having another session next year sometime. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Yes, Munim can be seen also now. Thank you, Professor Munim. <laughs> that is my limitation. If I see on my screen and I did not notice that Munim had joined us. But thank you for joining. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.